Well, uh, first of all, I want to extend a warm welcome to all of you uh, who have uh, joined this uh, virtual conference. Feels a little different. I mean, normally this would have been a live event, you know, in a nice big hotel or something where uh, we would have had an opportunity to shake hands. But uh, the way things are today, you know, unfortunately, you know, uh, we have to do this virtually. I sure hope that, uh, you know, uh, this uh, virtual experience of doing a conference uh, will be appreciated by everybody. But uh, given the current uh, situation of the pandemic, all of us are trying to do the best that we can. Right. But once again, a uh, very warm welcome to all of you. Um, I think uh, today's conference is really laser focused on digital transformation federal government. And my uh, keynote today will actually focus on, um, again, achieving you know, a digital transformation with a particular focus on the federal government. But also we'll talk through a few strategic and tact tactical enablers, right? With that, let's see. So uh, a little bit about uh, Radiant, as uh, Chris elegantly pointed out, uh, we are uh, a company that supports digital transformation efforts in various enterprises, be it in a commercial or federal. And uh, the way, uh, of course, you know, we do it is through a combination of uh, having the workforce that can support uh, such transformation efforts and uh, people being the asset. We are very blessed to have a very strong group of uh, uh, consultants uh, who help us navigate these digital transformation waters and then you get our customers to the destination, right? And all of this is again uh, backed by a set of very repeatable and transparent processes. Uh, of course, you know, there are certifications, but then you also have SDLC processes and uh, a bunch of other uh, process-oriented artifacts that help us uh, do this. But more importantly, you know, we have uh, had uh, some proven success with the customers by bringing in some proven methodologies. And by way of what we do, we support both uh, federal and commercial customers. And from that standpoint, we have a unique viewpoint into as to how federal customers look at things versus how commercial customers look at things, right? I mean, the points of view don't always match. And that's a good thing. Because what it then allows us to do is cross-pollinate ideas, you know, between the federal customers and the commercial customers. Uh, lately, especially the federal government has been on the front end of uh, a lot of IT transformation, some great initiatives going on. If anybody is keeping track of what the federal government is doing these days, in some pockets of uh, federal government, the level of excellence is far beyond what even commercial enterprises have achieved especially with respect to application development and, um, and other specific areas. But then again, you know, on the commercial side, you know, there's a lot of excitement all the time. So new technology is constantly utilized, you know, uh, for various different reasons. So end of the day, what we enjoy doing is bringing both the, you know, schools of thought together for the benefit of our customers. So, so let's start uh, with what's going on here today, right? You know, with this focus on digital transformation, let's start with the definition. I mean, you know, there are multiple definitions, but oftentimes, you know, we use digital transformation as a very effective process of using digital technologies, you know, to create new processes and experiences, you know, to meet changing requirements in this case, you know, of the citizens, right? Because the focus of the government is service to citizens. Whereas a commercial enterprise focuses on other drivers, as we will see later. But then what's going on today, in our opinion, and this is somewhat of a provocative statement, and um, the concept of digital transformation, while it's being discussed in various quarters, it hasn't caught the attention of the government's ears yet. And you know, there are multiple reasons for that, right? You know, again, as uh, Scott pointed out uh, previously, you know, in his presentation, uh, in the fireside chat, the government moves at a different pace. It looks at things very differently. You know, it is not exactly a business driver, right? It's not about profitability. It's about something, you know, that has to fit into an agenda. 
again, and there should be a key driver for that. So for that reason, that, that could explain some as to what's going on. And then there is also uh, sometimes a mistaken belief that just because digital transformation has got to do with effective use of technology, it's all about using emerging technology. Then uh, that doesn't help either in terms of advancing the agenda. But more importantly, you know, what appears to be a, a very valid reason though is, is uh, the federal government has really devoted itself to the concept of enterprise architecture and IT investment management. For a period of time, you know, since 2000, the government has made, you know, I mean, there's a, a lot of regulatory uh, framework behind it, going back to President Bush and even before then to the Clinton administration by way of, you know, uh, you know, Paperwork Reduction Act, and then uh, the President's Management Agenda, lately, you know, with Vitara. So, EA has become a, a fairly significant component of a CIO's thinking, and that, again, going hand in hand with IT investment management, with CPIC processes, you know, the cap capital planning and investment control processes, all of these are very rigorous. Somewhere in there, this whole concept of digital transformation doesn't necessarily register, and that's quite understandable. Now, that being said, though, there is no question that, you know, digital transformation is here to stay. It is happening. It's ongoing. And that's a big focus in the commercial sector. Because if you look at any commercial company enterprise, they all take pride in the fact that they have launched a digital transformation initiative or some digital transformation initiatives. And they are explained in terms of how they have changed their business model, their profitability, much to the benefit of their investors, their shareholders, and more importantly, the customers as well, right? But then, that being said, again, coming back to uh, the, the, the government arena, part of what happens again is, again, you know, with all this EA and IT investment management, digital transformation becomes one more thing to worry about. And sometimes, you know, it sounds complex and confusing. And appears challenging to implement, right? But then today, when we look at the current pandemic situation for the federal government also, uh, this COVID-19 has highlighted the importance of uh, transformation. I mean, whether we like it or not, a lot of things have happened. I mean, the federal government, you know, was what you know thinking in terms of a remote workforce, but for the past one year has to largely rely on a remote workforce. and. In a matter of you know few weeks, they managed to stand up an environment within which you know workers were able to work, you know get their job done, right? So what does this mean then? It means that you know for the right drivers, for the right reasons, it can catch the attention of the right people, and that's what we'll talk about, right? But in doing so, you know something that I want to also mention is uh, this is not about hype, right? We got to be able to resist hype and focus more on outcomes. And today, as we talk more about this later, we will see the enablers that make this to be very outcome driven. Now, I will also observe that, you know, as much as I said that, you know, the federal government is not exactly, you know, on the forefront of a digital transformation agenda, there's a lot of digital stuff going on today. There is no question. There's a digital this, digital that. I mean, you have, you know, a digital services division of the federal government, a lot of digital initiatives, but many of them are seen as a part of IT modernization initiatives where typically they tend to solve point problems. What we would like to really articulate as a hypothesis is, is you need to take a more expansive view of transformation, especially from the standpoint of, you know, uh, digital transformation and think in terms of something that really creates value. And the question comes up, what does value mean, right? How do you define that? So these become the, the, the key questions, right? With that said, now let's kind of, again, take a step back in terms of, you know, what's the noise, you know? I mean, why does anybody even have to worry about digital transformation? As I said, the bunch of drivers that drive it. I mean, we just talked about, you know, the pandemic. Whether we liked it or not, the pandemic caused a significant shift in thinking. But beyond that, you know, when you think in terms of federal government, oftentimes transformation is necessitated by change in regulation, which happens constantly in the government, right? Policy changes. Something, you know, that, you know, the our political leaders uh, envision in terms of 
something good for the citizens. I mean, the ACA is a big uh, uh, regulatory pressure that caused a whole host of things to change, right? And then there's also a desire to provide more efficient service to the citizens because, you know, many times you know, when services are broken, political leaders do listen, somebody complains, and things have to change. We have seen this with the case of Veterans Administration. What was considered to be a broken agency suddenly got its feet up and it's now going through a significant you know, modernization of it oriented towards serving our veterans better. That's a great thing. And something else that the federal government focuses on is, of course, you know, resilience and cybersecurity. And today, in this current threat environment, that becomes even more important. Now, as opposed to this, when you look at a commercial enterprise, it's a more straightforward story, right? It's about, you know, making money. Because a commercial enterprise cannot thrive unless, you know, it makes profit or it has access to abundance of uh, cash, you know, through various capital raising uh, uh, ventures or whatever. And then there's always a drive to reduce cost because, you know, you there's, you know, there's desire to increase shareholder value that causes that. But many times, you know, something that the commercial enterprises have realized is for them to be able to be in business, for them to be able to make money, especially, they got to cater to the customer and customer experience becomes important. But same thing, you know, when we you know, apply to the federal government, we say that, you know, the citizen experience has to become important, right? So, but then all of them, again, be it in you know, a federal or commercial drivers are oriented towards one fundamental concept, you know, which is all of, you know, universal needs, which are, we got to do things fast, better. We have to address people's needs. We need to improve processes. We need new technology. More importantly, we want to be innovative and we want to be on the bleeding edge, right? So with this in mindset, something that we, you know, we're also postulating today is that is, is as much as you have this regulatory pressure, something that's going on is uh, emerging technology is also becoming a significant driver for, for digital transformation. Now, we did say that technology is being utilized, but in a different way, emerging technology is coming in, but now the mindset has to change because what we don't need is mindless modernization, right? You know, just because you have technology, you don't want to resort to an exercise where you say, you know what, I'm going to modernize something. That's counterproductive. What you want to be able to do is see this as a continuum, you know, wherein whatever happens, happens for a greater good, which sounds very daunting and complex. But when we think in terms of a set of enablers, it starts becoming more easy. So let's first start with, you know, the problem with digital transformation. We said, you know, hey, it can be complex and confusing. Does it have to be? Well, it doesn't have to be. If we were to use enterprise architecture as an enabler, that's the fundamental postulate that we want to present today, right? A strategic view. Get your priorities right. Use EA as a vehicle or a framework for you to be able to establish your priorities. In doing so, you know, you have a, a very well-established methodology. In fact, you know, I will talk a bit more about this in, by way of as to how EA is going to assist you in establishing priorities. But then it's just not about you know, defining priorities and projects. It's about doing that, some, you know, something that produces value. From our perspective, value is driven by what is found to be useful by the end user. I mean, there is always the cost considerations and so forth. Now, one great thing that the federal government is blessed with is they don't necessarily think only in terms of cost, right? I mean, the government thinks in terms of doing something right. So when we say we want to do something right, we want to focus on citizen experience. And then that becomes an enabler because it helps you clarify, you know, what you need to do. And then helps you prioritize, you know, your projects better, furthermore, right? And then, you know, what you say is user experience now, right? Going from customer experience, which is more about clarifying more and more about what does the customer need to going to user experience is also, it touches upon what does the user need, but also how to do it so that the experience is enhanced, so that it is very easy to use, adaptable, right? You know, from that standpoint, when you bring that as an enabler, it helps you clarify concepts, you know, your proposals and results in some very concrete work products. But most importantly, none of this can work without a change management agenda. 
the biggest technology initiatives have failed because they haven't been communicated properly or somebody hasn't really thought about the value and then haven't you know necessarily focused on it but even if they did they didn't communicate it very well so this presentation is all about talking through these four enablers i mean if everybody gets this and if they know what we're talking about we can stop the presentation right here but then there is more to come right so as we move forward now let's talk in terms of ea enterprise architecture again as i noted before you know has been a very significant driver in the federal government you know cios are required to you know uh, uh, have a ea maturity model frameworks they're supposed to do ea compliance alignment and then there is a, a omb fea pmo that's you know plays oversight as a lot that the cio worries about in terms of enterprise architecture but the beauty of enterprise architecture is it becomes the medium through which the mission or the business can communicate to it if used effectively right it communicates the vision translates them into very concrete blueprints that can be implemented and then allows you to talk in terms of a common language wherein priorities are well understood and the key elements of ea from the standpoint of you know what needs to be utilized even for digital transformation would be a framework and a whole set of frameworks available a framework can be utilized very very rigorously to produce a lot or it can even be used very simply to clarify a few things and you will see that and then you can arrive at a reference model which becomes the guidance framework for you to do what you need to do in terms of your technologies your implementation your processes so that you know it you know literally results in a checklist and then what you need is governance because things are never static they change so you got to be able to update you know your reference models you know with the right kind of changes and be able to govern them in such a way that you know things are done consistently right so as we continue to think about ea becoming a, a uh, an enabler a very simple way to look at this is just to set your priorities right you can think in terms of a framework based analysis now there are a lot of frameworks out there this is what's zakman s as we call it you know zakman is you know a celebrity in the ea community and he came up with this whole notion of framework based thinking and a schema and you can define your own schema and what i'm showing here is merely an artifact i mean this is not god's a uh, truth by any means right you are welcome to define your a schema in terms of you know you know your drivers and components in this case we think in terms of a strategy component and a process component and a platform component and you know we say hey well now how do i look at the enterprise and say what elements of the enterprise should i look at i simply put business data application technology somebody else can put something else now what it allows you now to do you know is now to think in terms of each cell that results in the schema think in terms of what's important you know from a business strategy perspective we got to be compliant from a regulatory perspective e is a driver e is a priority now what does that result in terms of you know a series of initiatives or projects we want to be data driven or we want to be mobile first or we want to be cloud first these are strategy precepts right and they are identifiable you list them out right from a process standpoint you can say what enhances my process i mean this is where the rubber meets the road and ux and cx come in but you say you know what for me to be again this is where we bring in that cx framework all the time or the cx based thinking you want to say you know what i want to enhance my customer experience or i want to streamline operations or i need you know a data op you know ops framework for me to make sure that my users can understand how data is propagating through my system process automation i want cloud native development see you what's what's happening here is now you have a very systematic way of thinking through this makes the problem less complex right and as we continue now then comes the aspect of a reference model right again this is a very simple reference model you are welcome to define you you know your own reference model within the year practice the government itself you know as a part of the fiaf you know a framework and as to what you know the omb uses as a fiaf pmo you have reference models you know which talk in terms of a, a a performance reference model a business reference model application reference model data reference model and a technology reference model they have a purpose now again in terms of digital transformation we would like to think in terms of a reference model 
Because something else I forgot mentioning is enterprise architecture provides you the benefit of what's called as defining the scope of a problem. Enterprise doesn't have to be this big blue ocean that you're trying to boil. It doesn't have to be. What Zachman says is you can define the scope of the enterprise. So in this case, what we say is digital transformation becomes my scope. That's the scope within which I want to do things. You can consistently apply and then it becomes a part of your know, EA uh, work you know, that you're trying to do. Next thing you know, it's a part of your agenda. Now you're able to execute to it. So the reference model that we like to propose, and that's how we think today, and that's how we do business, is think in terms of three major buckets in terms of digital transformation. Uh, IT transformation, application transformation, and workforce transformation. For us, IT transformation means enabling a data-driven enterprise and a cloud-enabled enterprise. That's one way to look at it. Application transformation, where you are producing compelling software, something that you know is highly useful, highly purposeful, something that is being done quickly. Like this is where you know, terms like modernization and so on and so forth come in, right? And then workforce transformation, where what we're doing is, you know, more in terms of you know assisting the worker or the workforce become more efficient. That in itself results in a whole host of you know initiatives. End of the day, you can go from left to right or right to left, and you can end up with a series of initiatives. So you could marry this reference model with any other existing reference models, and you know you can still end up with something that will then help you think in terms of project portfolios, right? You could then list out your projects. Again, this is only an example, an artifact. So, which allows you to think in terms of various initiatives, right? You know, case in point, workforce transformation. I need to modernize my contact center because we need to be more efficient, right? And then, as we move along in terms of these artifacts, the other area that you then need to focus on is, hey, I have all these projects that I need to get done. Then what do I need as a competency profile? or as a management process. In this year-based thinking within this reference model, now you can create your reference model in terms of you know, driving competencies and methodologies and processes that you need. Something that I would like to draw your attention to is a, a very solid management framework in terms of a scaled agile process, something that you know that you know that makes sense to you. Also backed by a very strong set of people but then you know you have various processes and competencies that, uh, that you can baseline as being needed for you to be successful. At this point in time, you set the table right by way of you know, getting your digital transformation agenda executed. Now, where do we go next? Right? This is where now the rubber meets the road. What we're postulating is you become more tactical. You want to focus on the whole concept of CX, UX, and change management. These become the other enablers especially customer experience. The whole idea, again, from a federal government standpoint, is to provide a very holistic experience to a citizen where, you know, a citizen feels very close to the agency and is influenced by what's coming in and feels very, has a sense of belonging to the agency, right? So it helps you, when you think in that, in that framework, it helps you define our objectives as to what needs to get done. User experience. We have become believers in CX and UX because what we have seen today in terms of our own journey as I you know, talk through a couple of projects is how powerful these have become by way of become, making projects more purposeful and meaningful, especially you know, with user experience when you're focused on utilizing digital technology effectively, it allows you to understand what exactly needs to be done. It has become a, a true requirements driver, but then more importantly, there is change management so that you know whatever technology you're producing is adopted effectively by the users, right? As we move along, now we can again go back to the framework based thinking to say, well, you know, if you say CX, UX, and uh, CM, those, so what am I supposed to do with it? You can define your you know, drivers and goals. You can then again use a Zachman esque framework to say, I want to produce for IT transformation the right data, the right platform the right journey is from an application perspective. You know, from a CM standpoint, I want to force, you know, higher adoption of applications, become metrics driven. From a UX perspective, for workforce, provide a highly efficient interface. You start seeing these priorities emerging, they become your guiding principles, which will then allow you to execute a process which necessarily produces some very solid applications, right? 
let's start with CX. I mean, some of you know this, but I will tell you there is one thing that we want to say today is the value that we are finding in using these enablers to produce great applications and getting done projects in such a way that they produce value. With CX, especially, you know, you're focused on empathizing with a, a customer or a citizen's journey in terms of what they want. So a lot of steps to it. There is a user discovery step and you can do journey mapping. You think in terms of personas, but end of the day, it's all about understanding what the customer wants and defining specific needs, right? So you want to be able to draw a problem cleanly and clearly, right? Oftentimes that is done through journey maps. When we look at this again, this is produced by, you know, uh, uh, you know, it's a federal government artifact, you know, the source being digital.gov. As you map the journey, it's quite apparent as to what the user's pain points are, what the user wants, needs, right? What they're performing, and then where the potential opportunities are for improvement. At this point in time, now you're able to use technology effectively, not mindlessly. It results in a set of, you know, the key priorities that are focused on getting the job done for the user, for the citizen, right? Now, coming to UX, once the needs are defined, now how do you produce a highly efficient and high performant you know, interface, which is what the user uses, right? To interact in the system. So this is where there's a lot of an exploration through ideation and prototyping and you, you could use storytelling as a technique and you know a lot of questions about how might we, right? And what results here as a artifact would be solid wireframes, right? Extremely well-defined, you know, uh, wireframes with focus on various concepts, guided navigation, if it is necessary, how does the user navigate? Information architecture, where to look, placement of, you know, your various, you know, widgets, to be used by the customer. Now, all of this is not being done in a vacuum, right? You are constantly interacting with the user, getting the feeling, you know, getting the, getting to understand what exactly they want. In our experience, user experience, you know, when UX, when melded with the standard development processes, has become a powerful vehicle to produce some very compelling experiences or applications, right? So. Again, once you know, uh, we go through this UX process, it's all about, you know, doing some usability testing, you know, using research, you know, backed methods to understand what the user thinks and feels about the interface and modifying it if necessary, implementing, you know, your ideas, which then gets us to the most important concept that this is not a, a one way, a water flow type of approach, you know, waterfall type of an approach, but more of a iterator process wherein you're constantly doing this. Now the challenge is how do you meld this into your lifecycle development processes? This is where, you know, with Agile, Scaled Agile and various, you know, approaches, you're finding those opportunities to continuously engage the user and use CX and UX as a vehicle to produce great applications, you know, to digitally transform the enterprise, right? And the underlying principle through this iterative uh, exercise is governance. And, you know, I mean, that's something that I assume, you know, most of you know, but but making sure that, you know, you're making the right decisions for the right reasons constantly, not having any major reactions. And then comes the most difficult part, managing change. So when we think through this, right, the only way change can happen is through communication, effective communication. And from that standpoint, when digital transformation is seen as a big change enabler in an enterprise, the only way it can get, uh, it can get done is through effective communication. And from our standpoint, we have been highlighting this a lot. There is no question that, you know, digital, uh, you know, transformation or any transformation effect when effectively communicated results in greater user adoption, executive buy-in, and generally, you know, also results in a great feedback from the users so that you feel purposeful and you feel value driven. Now, how do we do it? What we are promoting, uh, you know, as a, a true enabler is digital communication. Lately, this has become a very powerful technique. You know, there are multiple methods to do it, but the whole concept of digital storytelling, which is in one way focused on communicating to the user what is uh, going on, 
working with the users again to get them to tell you what's going on through digital storytelling techniques, clarifying concepts, especially for executives, this becomes a great tool for them to understand what's going on. And for the users also, it becomes a great adoption engine. And we have seen this being very successful. And we have seen that wherever we use these kind of digital communication methods, we've been able to communicate the business value very effectively. Now, I'll quickly go through about uh, three you know, uh, use cases of projects where you know, we've been able to show that you know, these concepts have heavily benefited you know, the, uh, the outcome. The first one is a workforce transformation uh, case study where the focus was on producing something you know, for a contact center where the users are using very archaic technology. But our goals from a, a, a while doing the CX studies and all, it became quite apparent that, you know, from an executive perspective, it is about reducing the cost of, you know, uh, the backends. And from a executive standpoint, they also want the users to not to feel way too emotionally attached with legacy systems, right? And the users themselves want to hide complexity, but big picture, you know, you want to change a culture wherein you feel like, no, I can't change my applications because somehow I'm married to them, right? So what, end of the day, what was the, the, the key driver for this was efficiency and consistency. What takes 30 days to get done should be done in 30 minutes and consistently, you know, without any uh, errors, right? Case in point here is about 110 plus you know, legacy systems, multiple UI technologies, more than you know, 10,000 users spread over 100 different countries. Now, with multiple stacks of you know, network technology, you can see what kind of a beast this is. And this did not happen overnight. It took, it still goes on, happened, you know, it's been going on for more than three years now. And the way we could get this done is again, using CX and UX, especially UX as a powerful vehicle by engaging you know, users to produce a unified user interface framework which then allowed us to constantly work with the user interface, you know, to meet the uh, uh, user needs and key things being guided navigation, reducing the cognitive load on the user so that they can easily understand what needs to be done and right. And also promote their engagement, you know, with respect to their work through game based mechanics and so on and so forth. And the outcome was phenomenal the task time was reduced by 60%. What happens to be these chair swivels where the users have to go through multiple applications, they were reduced by 80%, far more, uh, far less, you know, clicks. And then more importantly, the UI footprint reduced significantly, right? And then from the standpoint of the business executive, lots of, you know, hours saved, lots of money saved, right? The other example we want to talk in terms of IT transformation is development of a customer data platform. Now you have data sitting all over in all kinds of portals. And then when the customer realizes that data is really more valuable than money sometimes because it allows you to make money, you need customer insights. There is this big driver to produce, to have a, a customer data platform. But in doing so, you understand initial drivers which about platform stabilization, right? With focus on highly performing infrastructure, solid data engineering, security, role-based access, and from a process perspective, DevOps and data ops. And what we produced, again, with, by understanding in this case, the CX manifests a little different, differently, and the UX is actually also manifested through the notion that the users, as much as data sitting there, they want to understand the motion of the data. The big aha is you say, you know what? We need data ops. That's good enough, right? Because now the users have visibility into what exactly is going on. They have a highly scalable platform. It's modernized and it enables multiple applications wherein the applications, you know, which are the window for the users to use the data through which they have visibility into how data is being managed, how it's being improved for quality, how it's being staged. All of it is you know, visually available to you. And then that enhances, again, the customer experience. And the last example that I want to bring up is the case where, you know, this is more of a backend modernization with a, uh, what is seen as a, a trouble ticketing system, which serves multiple applications, right? 
And then as the number of applications increases, performance becomes a more bottleneck. So this is a slightly different kind of a problem. There is a different facet to this in terms of a, a something which is more user focused, where the user uses the interfaces, but you have a large application which is monolithic and it is really suffering from a performance perspective. Now, what you had to accomplish is high performance and also decoupling of the system so that you know, changes can be done more frequently. So in this case, what we focused on is API enablement and publishing of APIs. And that became the project that was necessary, again, based on the customer needs and a user experience, wherein you know user doesn't have to wait for 50 years to get their changes. Because now it is decoupled, you're able to publish APIs and they're able to, you know, they're being utilized effectively. And similarly, performance improvements through effective caching and streaming techniques and deployment through, you know, uh, virtualization and Kubernetes-based techniques, right? And then re-performing, you know, uh, refactoring the application architecture with microservices now becomes a big driver as well. So with those three use cases, now at this point in time, you know, of course, you know, the outcomes were fantastic, especially the API management was greatly appreciated, right? And then from a process perspective, there's a DevSecOps, DataOps are enabled, microservices are being, you know, produced and orchestrated, and the system becomes very efficient in terms of handling large volumes of messages and um, highly you know, performant in terms of you know, request response models. Now, with that said, you know, uh, I would like to now put in a you know, plug-in for uh, small businesses. Well, what I refer to as growing businesses, Radiant is one of them. You know, what I want to point out is within the right context, within the right framework, Nobody should be surprised that small businesses can think big and produce the right results. Okay, because I think the benefit that you have is with small businesses is they're less bureaucratic. You can always think out of the mainstream, less constraints. You know, it allows small businesses to focus on the user more because you see that as being a value in response to your, you know, your, to your client needs. And then the ability to build great teams, right? So end of the day, I would like to say without any doubt that you know small businesses can enable digital transformation and should be afforded the right opportunity, especially by the federal government. With that, I would like to thank you all. And uh, Chris, back to you. Thank you so much, Shankar. A great, great presentation there. You've uh, you managed to cover off uh, an awful lot in uh, in a short amount of time. So, um, well done for that, and uh, for you know covering the landscape uh, pretty efficiently and very well there. So, th thank you so much for that presentation. Uh, really, really. My well. yeah. um, one one of the um, the slides that resonated most was somewhere in the middle the slide that said about digital transformation uh, is enabled by effective communication now uh, love that slide and, and, and love that sentiment is something we hear so much of at this event series and you know so much of the private sector kind of echo uh, uh, that sentiment as well what, what I want to put to you is is how difficult has as kind of effective communication been over the last 12 months kind of given the restrictions and barriers uh, um, that have been put up in in every sense of the word. No, I mean, needless to say, the inability to shake hands and meet people in person has been a big uh, damper. Mm -hmm. But this is where I think the digital communication aspect has really become a powerful technique. Mm -hmm. You know, good news, you know, is with technology, we are still able to perform what we need to do. Today morning, I was reading an article where somebody asked a rhetorical question. Had this pandemic happened 20 years ago, where would we be? Yeah. We would be in hell. Yeah. Right? Today, what we're blessed with is great connectivity, you know, ability to, the world has become smaller. And against that backdrop, you're still able to do things. Mm -hmm. And this is where the digital communication techniques become a powerful tool to keep you know, everybody abreast of what's going on, Chris. Mm -hmm. Right? Nice. Yeah. That's a good answer. We've had a we've had a question coming from the audience here, um, from Jimmy. So thank you to Jimmy for this. Uh, you mentioned in case study one, the project has been going on for three years. Can you please explain if you are recognizing incremental measured value on an ongoing basis? Absolutely. Yeah. No. Uh, the, 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 that is the trick, right? You know, the increase. You know, me measuring value over increments, and the increments in this case being various portfolios, right? Mm. 
and you know each portfolio has a different characteristic when you do this because when you think in terms of a large telecom enterprise it has multiple portfolios including you know provisioning engineering planning and so on and so forth mm-hmm. you address each one of them and you address different geographical regions you know regionally nationally mm-hmm. internationally so in each area now we establish you know those performance measures metrics and you report them continuously and that's what actually keeps the project going i mean unless you show that you're producing business value somebody is going to say you know what enough is enough there's a distraction yeah, yeah. no that's good and right? then and then with with the kind of the again a lot of focus kind of on on the pandemic here how have your kind of clients needs changed throughout the pandemic have you seen a big shift um towards uh, you know bigger problem areas or are we kind of looking at the same things we were looking at pre pandemic well you know the pandemic has placed a very interesting challenge right on one end i think you know uh, initially because of this shift to a full uh, online culture work from home culture there was definitely a noticeable slow down but then once we got past it the new ideas many of the ideas are now focused on dealing with the pandemic yeah and you know during the pandemic you know many of the initiatives now are again focused on cyber security because of the current threat environment more yeah. online selling because you know customers have become habituated more with online selling right so these have become big drivers and especially in the technology sector they have kept in things very interesting so we continue to keep busy although we certainly are hoping for this pandemic to go away and you know <laughs> with the full blown activity coming back hopefully at the end of the spring here Yeah. And, and and then lastly um with with digital transformation obviously there are there are many elements of what makes for successful digital transformation and I kind of closed off with this question as well um with Shane earlier um and I just wanted to kind of gather from all the the leaders that we have here today and kind of get a, an idea of what everyone thinks is the most crucial element to kind of successful transformation and I just wanted to to hear from you on that point of view what where you think the biggest you know enabler was for digital transformation bar kind of effective communication as covered you know i think you know what really drives you know uh, makes digital tra- transformation worthwhile because you mm. asked the question now uh, you know what makes it successful mm. what makes it successful is producing this business value on a continuous ongoing basis yeah business value defined both by qualitative and quantitative uh, factors right so uh, an understanding of the of that you know in the front end Yeah. through analysis and you know, again using enterprise architecture again as a vehicle to clarify some of those things becomes critically important wherever you can show something is faster better cheaper i mean it sounds very cliched end yeah. of the day that's common sense right and that's yeah, sure. what we need to get to you know make sure. it more intuitive more easy right mm-hmm. make things you know very simple reduce complexity so these are the key questions that we need to focus on to make digital transformation successful sure and then finally just just one more quick one as well what would you say to to any organization or, or agency that were looking at partnering with an organization like yourselves and what 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 should why should they kind of be working with organizations like radiant digital well simply because we get it right see what i postulate yeah. today is it is not technology for technology sake it's about technology producing business value and i think you know from our standpoint i'm proud to say as a business we have built a business around this message we are structured that way so mm-hmm. when a federal government customer looks at you know a potential partner uh, to enable this transformation they need to look at all these facets beyond mm-hmm. saying are they technically competent do they understand mm-hmm. how to enhance in a great customer experience or produce great customer experience use the right mm-hmm. tools be able to communicate you want that whole package and that is the key right you know and that's what you know we would like to really and you know encourage the cios to think through that they yeah. build all these concepts into their procurement processes so they, they so that they end up getting a really a true solution that is adopted by the users not a yeah. solution that sits and gets mm-hmm. smartboard Good stuff, well, Shankar. That's all we've got time for. Thank you uh, again so much for for joining, um, for your brilliant keynote presentation. There, as mentioned, you you 
covered a, a lot of ground there in a short space of time uh, and also for the Q&A session some some good insights offered there um, you're obviously um, headline sponsor of this event you've, you, you supported us back in in 2019 um, you know in person and, and obviously through today in this online format so it's brilliant to have you back with us um, uh, there'll be some resources shared uh, on the conference page for getting in touch with Radiant Digital and Shankar's team as well um, so do look at that but thanks again Shankar a real pleasure to have you with us today. No, it's my pleasure. You know, I, I really enjoy talking through this and uh, would be happy to uh, support any questions that may come later.